When Ronald Reagan was in his second term as president, I packed up my 1985 Mercury Cougar in tiny Breckenridge, Texas, home of the Buckaroos, by the way, Mm. and I drove four and a half hours to College Station to begin classes at Texas A&M. Enrollment back then was 39,000. It's almost twice that now, which is hard to believe. And I arrived here knowing nothing. I had to find a place to live and set up utilities, a cable, get a phone number, Long distance service, kids, ask your parents about that. And then figure out how to navigate a gigantic campus, a difficult major that I had absolutely no business being in. And even though I had a pretty easy time in high school, I didn't know how to study. I mean, at all. So guess which high school honor student nearly flunked out? (laughs) But I didn't. I barely held on. I found new roommates who did know how to study. Thank you very much, John and Mike. I changed majors and I finally got things on track. So here's the deal. In hindsight, I could have used someone to talk to during the toughest moments in my life at that point. And maybe I should have looked for help, but it didn't occur to me to do that. I didn't know anyone who had done that, and I wouldn't have even known where to look. So again, I knew nothing. But times have changed, students are different, and so is Texas A&M University when it comes to resources. Welcome to Brazos Matters. I'm Jay Sokol, and I get to talk today with Christy De La Garza, Assistant Director for A&M's Counseling and Wellbeing Services. Christy, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to be here and really honored that you have decided to talk to me today about mental health and just the, the culture on this campus of asking for help, seeking help, and what services are available. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I think we're going to have a great chat. So start out, if you don't mind, by explaining the depth and breadth of counseling and well-being services at Texas A&M? Oh, gosh. That's a big question. It is a big question, yeah. right? Yeah. I guess I better preface this with this is probably coming from my perspective, um, my experience. I've been at um, at the counseling uh, area for here at um, College Station and A&M for 16 years. Mm-hmm. And it's really morphed and changed, and people talk about mental health a lot and how to get support, right? So our services has really grown and expanded over the years. So for counseling and well-being, well-being care, we provide the mental health and support for our entire campus community, which, as you mentioned, has you know gotten to about an enrollment of 70,000 students. And so with a staff of between 30 and 40 um, professionals, we're always looking for ways to support our students. Mm -hmm. So we have um, individual counseling that students can um, register for appointments to come in and see a a professional counselor and explore some of those things of maybe I'm not even sure what I don't know, but I know I don't feel right. Um, They can come in for maybe a little psychoeducation. Maybe they just need to better understand this uncertainty they're feeling, the anxiety they experience. Um, We have workshops where they can sign up and kind of do a one and done or maybe a two series workshop learning about who they are, how they feel, and how can they manage those feelings in a healthier way. Um, We have groups where students can feel supported by their peers that are experiencing similar um, mental health issues, and it's led by our professional staff. Um, We have an amazing app, which I hope we have time to go into more depth about. It's called MySSP, My Student Support Program. Provides support for students 24-7, anytime, anywhere. Um, And and then we just have a a big staff of um, professionals that are looking for ways to support our students during these times whenever they're struggling. Yeah. Is there a... a pattern semester after semester, year after year, of the kind of students who typically seek you out? Or does it change all the time? I think it is changing. Um, In the past, uh, it was a little more taboo to say you were in therapy or that you're seeking mental health um, support. Um, and so it's really changed over the years as we've we've worked really hard, and I think globally worked really hard to destigmatize that idea of mental health. Um, it's actually a good thing. We want to be healthy mentally, right? Mm. And so we've really encouraged students to and people to ask for help. So it's not uncommon for students now to say, well, my therapist has said mm. this, that, and the other. And so I think we continue to see an, an increase in students reaching out for mental health 
and needing that support. So over the years, I think it's just really increasing. I don't know if it's an ebb and flow, but we definitely just every spent since the pandemic particularly have seen an incredible increase of students wanting mental health support for anxiety and depression and relationship concerns. Yeah. Probably our biggest issues. So it's good to hear that it's being destigmatized and that more students feel comfortable doing this. How about their parents and their family members? Do do they get a little up, you know, anxious about, oh my gosh, my kid is is going and talking to a counselor or are parents coming around as well? I really think that parents are coming around as well. And that kind of can depend on um, culturally where the student is from. I think some, um, there's some uh, folks that will think, hey, that's a family issue. Let's just talk to each other about these concerns. Don't go and kind of spread Mm. our issues out to society. I think some, there's still some folks that believe that, but I do think overall, parents are actually encouraging their students to come in and seek that mental health support. hey, do you need a counselor? Let's get you set up with a counselor. So I really feel like um, there's a a really increasing amount of support for students seeking that mental health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. So as we've mentioned, we have more than 70,000 students on campus and they're like snowflakes. You don't have any two of them being alike, I'm sure. So how are you able to provide comprehensive yet varied Uh, mental health support for such a diverse collection of young people? Oh, gosh. That is something we're always working on um, because I think the needs of the students are always evolving. Hmm. So we have a wide range of professional staff. Um, We hire um, staff that can speak uh, other languages so that we can provide that emotional support for students that might feel more comfortable speaking in their native language. Um, And then with that, so then we have psychologists, social workers, licensed professional counselors, trainees, um, practicum students, interns. Um, And so we have a wide variety of diverse staff. And then they bring in their own um, strengths. Hey, you know what? I really want to provide a safe space for our students of of color to gather and just talk about what it's like to be on a predominantly white campus. So Mm. we create groups for those students. And so we have a let's talk program where students can kind of have a a little bit less structured approach to talking about their concerns in the International Student Support Services building, in the Department of Multicultural Services, in the Pride Center so that they can at least start getting their, dipping their toe into asking for help and looking for support. So we just, we continue to look for ways to support our students. Right. I'm guessing that a lot, maybe most of your clients come to you when there is already a crisis. And so I'm wondering, should they be seeking you out or seeking your staff out or your online resources before they get to that point of crisis? Oh, gosh. Yes, we really wish that would happen. And we recognize that life is unpredictable. I think sometimes students don't recognize that they're really floundering until they have reached a point of crisis or needing some urgent care. And and then they come in and we do have crisis walk-in appointments for students anytime Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. And sometimes a crisis happens where it's unexpected. It lost a family member or something tragic has happened to them um, unexpectedly. So we, we always are going to have that. But I do think that if students would recognize that mental health is something we take care of every day, that's whether it's um, asking their peers for support. Hey, I'm kind of struggling talking to a professor. I think I'm, you know, I'm not sleeping well, so I had a hard time handing in this ap- this assignment. Um, talking to a professional a faculty member who might say, hey, you know what, I know there's resources available. Please seek those out. There's, there's workshops that I think you might want to just start learning about um, getting unstuck because you sound like you're a little, feeling a little sad. And then we also have this um, amazing app, which you'll hear me reference frequently. It's called currently called My SSP, My mm-hmm. Student Support Program. And one of the main things that this is, it's, it's meant to serve as a um, short-term counseling approach and support p- approach for students. So they can text 
chat, call this through this app 24 seven. It could be two o'clock in the morning and their roommate is really breaking them down. They're not having a good relationship with their roommate who's in their dorm bed right next to them. And who do they, can they talk to? Well, they can always chat and they can text somebody from the MySSP app and say, you know, I need some help with my roommate. Uh, I don't feel safe, whatever it might be, so that they can start getting that intervention in the moment. So that kind of help is on demand. And there's a real person on the other other end? Yeah, Yeah. they are professional counselors that are on the other end of this app. And so within 90 seconds, the students, if they download the app proactively, again, get kind of seeking support before it snowballs into a, a crisis or an urgent um, concern. Yes, there's professional counselors that are on the other end of this app waiting to say, hey, making sure, obviously, if this isn't um, life or death, they check on that first. Mm. If this is a crisis, they will um, diff- have a different intervention for that. But if the student's just wanting to talk, they can chat about what that is and think about what kind of support do they need. They can call two o'clock in the afternoon on the way to class. I'm nervous about a test. Uh, I just need to, my heart's racing. I just want to talk to somebody to settle down. There's a professional counselor on the other end of that line that can help them strategize ways to prepare for the exam, whatever they need. Boy, could I have used that back in 1987 and 88. Holy smokes, that's great. Yeah, I could still use it today. (laughs) True. So you talking about that has made me wonder, because um, I've I've read and heard just little bits and pieces about all the possibilities that AI brings to us. What does it bring to the world of, of counseling and therapy, good or maybe not so good? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to hear that from you. Well, can you give me an example of kind of what's going on in your head on that one? Well, for instance, if uh, if there's not a live person on the other end, if there is some resource, maybe it's not my SSP, but it's um, there are other resources out there where uh, it feels like you are having a conversation, seeking advice, and there is an automated, uh, you know, large language model out there that's somewhat equipped to give you dialogue back that makes sense. I know these sorts of technologies and services are developing and I didn't know if you and your professional peers are hearing about it reading about it talking about it I'm gonna have to just give you my personal perspective on that because I'm not hearing okay conversations in my arena on a campus counseling center we're a little bit specialized because we do focus on what students are needing um, and I don't think it's AI um, approach to mental health personally. Mm-hmm. And I'll kind of give you um, what guides some of my answers even today and, and my work in therapy is the innate need for humans to feel connected to another human being. Right. And that's, we're born that way. You know, you think about, uh, that's just, a, it's a natural thing that as, as infants, we need to be comforted and it's usually soothed through another person. And I think we're, we are, we're drawn to that connection and it's with another human being. And hopefully it would be great if it's another person who's sitting mm-hmm. in a chair across from you. Mm-hmm. You know that's a, a heart beating across from you that understands where you're coming from and is personalizing their response based off of your experience. I really value that. And I think the students value that connection too. I, I'm so glad to hear you say that, but because I do listen to a lot of podcasts and interviews and and. I don't know if they're experts, but at least pundits, some of them are experts, who talk about how uh, AI can do things perhaps like help solve what the U.S. Surgeon General has called an epidemic of loneliness, that this can, you know, can help with that, which seems counterintuitive to me based on what you just talked about, that we need to be in connection with one another. Um, but I just uh, it's it's odd to me that, that a a voice that uh, comes from technology, that anybody thinks that that could fill the void in a real quality way. I totally agree with you on that. And it kind of makes me think about, I'm not overly technologically um, capable. I have to lean on my my, my kids a lot for, uh, for that, <laughs> what's new and the latest. But um, one thing I think that um, technology 
also is doing in general, not just with mental health, but it's kind of taking away from the process of, of struggle and having a human reaction to struggle. And th- there's a lot of value in an understanding what your process is so that you know what your purpose is. Mm. And I just, I really, I just cannot emphasize enough how important that is to, to understand, to struggle, recognize there's another human who is in this, you know, swamp with you <laughs> uh, and is pointing you to the direction on the other side. Like, hey, you, you just take one step at a time to get through there. You can't just leap and know, oh, this is what you should do to get to the other side because it's way prettier over there. Uh, you have yeah. to take one step at a time. If you just tuned in, I'm Jay Sokol. You're listening to Brazos Matters. My guest is Christy De La Garza, Assistant Director for A&M's Counseling and Wellbeing Services. I think when you and I were, were sort of swapping emails in the last few weeks, you talked about um, mental wellness being an everyday goal. So what do you consider mental wellness to be? I think, you know, I guess I could give you... Um Something that's been on my mind recently, and, and the students are going to hear about this in their here at A and M in their Hello Below You class. They're going to talk about the um, eight dimensions of wellness, mm. and there's like to kind of feel like you're you're rolling along in a nice circular wheel. There's going to be eight spokes to pay attention to in wellness and well-being. And so well-being is taking care of and having a balanced approach to these different dimensions. Um, of course, now I'm not going to remember all eight on the spot, but it's uh, it, it's social well-being, it's intellectual well-being, it's emotional well-being, environmental, financial, occupational. So there's so many, we're, we're complex humans, right? Mm. And so there's a lot of different areas to take care of to be well. And so there's there, there's a constant awareness of like, I think I'm feeling a little depleted in my social wellness and well-being area because I have been isolating myself. I, I notice I've been in my room a lot scrolling through TikTok or binging on Netflix right. and I'm not connecting to people. You think about your wheel on your, your bike or your car, once you... You, you don't take care of an area there like a flat spot starts to develop in your tire mm. and you kind of chug along a little bit and that's kind of what I, I think well-being is about is recognizing there's there's areas we have to pay attention to if we want to kind of roll through our lives in some sense of balance and well-being we have to take care of them go hey feeling a little flat in my social well-being I think I ought to reach out to at least one or two of my friends and ask them if they want to go walk through Aggie Park with me and just talk and connect, right? And so there's that sense of um, a constant sense of what do I need? How do I, where do I feel depleted? And how can I take care of that need? Sometimes we don't even know. So maybe we need to ask a professional and say, something's off. Um, I'm not feeling well. And so there's just this constant maintenance, right? It shouldn't be exhausting, It should be replenishing to think about what do I need um, for this well-being. Did that kind of hit on your question? It it does. It it really does. And and what you're talking about is so interesting because I've got a 22-year-old Aggie. And so so as you're talking me through this, I'm thinking about him. And I'm trying to think about life being experienced, you know, through his lenses. And um, he has so many more things to worry about than I did all those years ago when I was on this campus. And so I can only imagine the sorts of things that that you and your staff have to uh, help students address, not only on the short term, but I would think on an ongoing basis. Uh, the, there aren't necessarily quick fixes to everything. No. And just even thinking about how you started that question or the comment about how things have changed over the years. And I think um, there's a, 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 so much more knowledge and awareness of the struggles out there in the world, right? They are constantly on Twitter. They're constantly getting 30-second updates of what's happening in the world. Um, we had, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but we had the pandemic that told everyone, for your physical well-being, isolate, uh-huh. quarantine, <laughs> Don't be around, you know, others because it could be dangerous. Shut down the restaurants. You know, there was so much of this idea of like everything just shut down and just 
quarantine and be be a, be by yourselves. And what a, a a startling message that was for your son was probably in college, early college. He was. Year. He was. Mm-hmm. And that was a very difficult period for him. Absolutely. Right. It's not safe to be around your your support network. Right. And being being isolated and maybe not optimized for online learning and, and the whole thing. And, and, and so that interrupts the ability to go out and make friends and extend his social network. And, you know, so, so this group of students with the asterisk by them because mm-hmm. of the pandemic, wow, I don't know. It seems like there's some extra baggage with air quotes around baggage that, mm-hmm. that they're carrying around and have to navigate. I think there's a lot of wounds um, from that experience that um, need healing. And um, we all weren't really equipped to how this healing, what does healing look like for that um, that disruption and that acute uncertainty that was thrown on their laps. And so I think sometimes we even need to remind ourselves as adults and professionals of, hey, let's have some compassion um, we still want the students to feel accountable and, and resilient and strong, but we can have some kindness and, and kind of be aware of what judgments, even this, this, the, the students in this age group could practice probably less judgment on themselves and a little bit more compassion because they are still healing from some of those uncertainties. And that overexposure of global tragedy hmm. during that time um, I know I have um, both of my daughters are in that age group and watching the news is not something they are willing to do. Right. Because it's it's scary. It's heavy. It's heavy. It is definitely heavy. Hmm. So you you've talked a little bit about the My SSP mm-hmm. app. Talk to me more about that. Uh, why it really makes a lot of sense, even if it's just on, you know, your your phone or your tablet or what, what have you. And you. You mostly don't use it, but why is it so important? And and tell me more about those daily uses or even some examples, uh, real examples from folks on this campus who have used it. There's quite a few. And I think the idea of having it available um, for those, I mean, gosh, we just talked about life kind of taught us that there's a lot of uncertainties out there. Mm -hmm. Things come out of nowhere that we're not even anticipating so having this app downloaded on your phone, and they can also download it on their desktop um, computer. Um, I'm going to put it while I'm thinking about it. It's very easy to access information about my SSP because there's a there's a new mental health tab on the students' Canvas. Um, whenever they pull up their you know assignments, syllabus, or whatever it might be, over on the left hand side of their um, Canvas is at the bottom there's a mental health tab now and so and if they click on that they get information about my ssp app any of the mental health resources that are available there's even a new um, website called mentalhealth.tamu.edu and it has resources that students can access in the community on campus my ssp wellness information for career center academics what have you so all this information is easily available right there on canvas um, but to have the MySSP app downloaded on their phone, that can get them prepared for that in the middle of the night panic that they are having and they're having a difficult time breathing. And they sometimes students don't want to bother other folks. They're like, I don't yeah. want anybody to know right, right. that I'm suffering. This reminds them there's, it's okay to, to take that one step, as I was mentioning earlier, of take one step to take care of yourself. Reach out to MySSP call a counselor and just say, I don't even know where to begin. But I am having a hard time settling down to sleep tonight. Can you just talk me through something? Um, can I accept support from somebody? And just even learning that ability to connect and ask for help, I think, is really important. That's one of the benefits of the MySSP app. Right. And it also, I want to mention that they, um, I can't, I don't know if I mentioned that they have, they speak multiple languages. And so I think I did mention that. Um, they just can have support in any way that they feel like they might need in that moment. So in our final couple of minutes here, if you had the opportunity to be in a room with parents or family members who have 
a, a student who is about to enter Texas A&M, they're about to come here from wherever, mm-hmm. what's some advice that you would give from your office that might be helpful to these parents and then ultimately to their student? Gosh, I would um, remind parents to talk to their students and it's okay to ask, are you okay? Have you been feeling happy lately? Mm. Are you, is there something that you're struggling with that you'd like to talk about? I've noticed you seem more tired lately. Is there anything I can do to help? Just checking in and asking those direct questions with their their student is really important. If the student is similar to my daughters who, I'm fine, you know. Um, hey, I just want to remind you that there's some pretty great resources on campus. It's okay if you want to reach out and, and get some help. So being aware for parents, being aware of the resources that are available just in case their student, because the student can feel very overwhelmed on this campus. Yes. There's thousands of resources, to be honest. So kind of maybe honing in on your top five that you feel like this could really help my student be well and reminding your student about that. Um, you can call the counseling um, center. We, we, you can call us and talk to a professional counselor, a parent can, and just say, here's what's going on with my son or daughter. Do you have some suggestions? And they can ask, ask the professionals. That's what I guess the theme kind of is, is students and parents reach out to the professionals. We're here. We're available. And they're paying for the service. They are paying for our service. There's no additional charges for counseling, which is amazing. When you go out in the real world, it could be $200 an hour. There's no additional charges for our services other than the, the student enhancement fee that they pay. And back to my SSP, it's completely free. This is not the norm once you get outside of um, your student experience. And tell us again where online, whether you are a student, a family, or family member, or a friend, where they can go to learn more about the services you provide. Right now, if they put in CAPS, C-A-P-S, dot TAMU, dot E-D-U, that's going to take you directly to our mental, our link for our services. And you'll see the workshops, you'll see self-help, you'll see my SSP. We are, we have merged with University Health Services now. So there's, it's going to be a transition. So if you go to U hs.tamu.edu, you will see information about the medical side of the support for our students also. Christy De La Garza, thank you so much for this talk. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be talking about it and I welcome more conversations. You can learn more about us, Brazos Matters, at kamu.tamu.edu slash radio. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a great day.